Hey, everybody. Hey, to you in the room and those of you joining us online, whenever or wherever you are, a warm welcome and weird weather to Smoky Hill Vineyard. Uh, if you've got a Bible, please turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, the Gospel of Mark is in the right half of your Bible. If you look at it and open it, it's to the right. We'll be in Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, while you flip or scroll there. My name is Greg. I'm one of our pastor students. What's up? Where are you at? Hey. No, no, no uh, noises but waves. Hi. Uh, to tip things off, question, how is your March Madness bracket going? Eh. Okay. Uh, did anyone have any upsets over the last few days? Yeah. Okay, we're feeling mad tonight. All right. Uh, how about Caitlin Clark, though? This girl from Iowa, have you seen her? She is still sensational, is she not? Now, I ask, why do we mention sports? Because for many of us, around this time, this is not about sports as much as it is about something more than sports. Consider a recent New York Times article when they noted the soulful spiritual aspect of games have elevated them to something like a modern religious experience. Really? Well, it follows. Think of this year's Super Bowl, yeah? How much of a record viewership they had. Or Caitlin Clark, the girl from Iowa, she became the all-time leader, both men's and women's, to be the scoring champ in basketball. Or how about more tenderly, do you remember DeMar Hamlin last year receiving CPR on the field, gripping the nation, and then later making a stand for all to see? Do you feel it? The writer asks, the soulful, spiritual nature of what has become one of our greatest faiths, sports. Him, the author being a religious agnostic, says these moments transport us, meaning we get so caught up in the moment. And he says this isn't exactly new. Uh, our ancestors thought of these venues as participating and communicating in something of a spiritual power. One of the reasons, I think, is because it's analogous to a spiritual experience. And we so yearn for the real thing that we will take any slice or seize any moment of transcendence that we can, whether it's in the mountains or on media. But Greg, really? We're thinking this deeply about sports? Come on. Well, as we'll see in our text in Mark chapter 11, there is something quite similar to what historically we've celebrated as Palm Sunday going on then and now. Similarities, there is fervor bustling and brewing. The clamor and the culmination of a particular moment. The city of Jerusalem then was in turmoil. Not unlike our cities right now. The city of Jerusalem then and our cities now are longing for something much deeper and realer than what is presently there. If you haven't been tracking with us lately, we have been in this Lenten practice this year on the good news of Jesus. To pattern our thinking, our feeling, and our acting on the identity and activity of Jesus. And if you're unfamiliar with the Library of Scripture, we have four accounts of the life and teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I saw this this week, and I wanted to give you a frame before we kept going. Look with me on the screen. The first book of Matthew presents Jesus as a greater Moses. And get this, groups Jesus' teaching into five blocks, similar to the five books of the Torah. Luke's account displays how Jesus is God's royal servant and from Isaiah, his role as being a light to the nations. John focuses on Jesus' claims that he is God in the flesh, doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. And then for our purposes, Mark, his main emphasis is that Jesus is the new start, bringing the mystery of new creation into the present. So I'm going to read a few verses, we'll pray, we'll walk around in the text, 
and then we'll end with a question to contemplate. Sound good? Sweet. Mark chapter 11, verse 1. Follow with me. Now when they, the disciples in Jesus, drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away, found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing? Untying the colt. And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, or Hoshana in Greek. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Let's pray together. God, each of us come to you as honestly as we know how. And we're asking for you to do what only you can do. For you to take information and turn it into transformation. For you to speak to us powerfully and personally. For heaven to come here with all beauty and peace. So would you come by your grace for your glory. And if this is new or normal for you, I'd encourage you to take a few deep breaths. In and out. Well, Holy Spirit, we trust that you're going to produce what you want to produce in us. So we might partner with you and what you're doing in this world. We pray that for the sake of Jesus' name. Amen. Question. Have you ever wanted a great work of God to occur in your life? Have you? George Whitfield, bring it all the way back, 1700s, wanted that too. He longed for it so badly that he got kicked out of the church. At the time, in the UK, people were not going to church. The conditions of life were extremely hard, and it led people to focus and become consumed with their work, which led to marginalization and isolation. Does it sound familiar? But Whitfield uh, rode on his horse to these communities, and there was one in particular called Kingswood, because he had this idea in his mind that he would set up a gathering just outside the coal mines to preach to those unreached. People told him, no way, you'll get mugged and you'll get mocked. I think about places here in Denver, don't go there. But Whitfield persisted and after a long work day, these people, soot stained and exhausted, actually lingered around to hear Whitfield preach about Jesus. He started to unwind the Sermon on the Mount that the kingdom of God, the good news, the good life is for those who are poor in spirit. And were they ever poor in spirit? The kingdom of God is for the unimportant, overlooked, and the great work of God is for the gentle. And then all of a sudden in uh, Whitfield's diary he records what became visible in the crowd were these clean white streams that cracked open the soot-stained faces. These hardened people, using hardened tools, became soft. And this is what the gospel does. It's what Mark says, the new creation is present and available to us. A light has dawned that is so lovely that washes the interior and exterior of our lives. It breaks up the hardened ground. It alleviates the conscience. And it actually moves us into society in a different way. Get this, social renewal ended up happening in that town. It's what often is called the Great Awakening. And not only was there a Great Awakening, but equipment 
started to reappear. Meaning, yes, the tools that were stolen by the coal miners actually returned to the coal mines. The coal mines became more productive and safer. Hearts changed, and that led to hands changing. A school was actually even uh, put up to help educate those who did not have access to it. Eyes here. The key insight, if you want a great work of God in your life, it starts and is preceded by not power, not self-actualization, but surrender, weakness, and powerlessness. The very thing that you and I want in our lives is setting the stage here for verse 1. These people long for what we long for. So what does Jesus have to say? Let's look at verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead. Uh, Jesus, if you didn't know, has now planned and timed his arrival to be in Jerusalem for the seven-day-long stretch called the Passover, i.e. the most charged, volatile, and significant week of the whole year on the Jewish calendar. Archaeologists estimate that the first century city would hold about 50,000 people, but during Passover, it was believed that this small and squishy city would swell to about 150,000 pilgrims within and around the city. In context, that is two to three times the Bronco Stadium attempting to fit in their own parking lot. The Broncos could never do that. Yeah, not after this offseason. Speaking of football, Passover week was like the Super Bowl of the ancient world. People would make pilgrimages from all the ends of the earth to make their sacrifices to their deity. Football. Right? For Jesus, all that he is doing here and is about to do is architected and it is bustling with meaning. It's all prearranged. How? Well, did you know that at the time Jerusalem was under Roman oppression and Caesar specifically had his own triumphal entry on the very same day? Caesar rode in from a white horse from the west, Jesus rides in on a donkey from the east. Two kingdoms divided in one place. And it's noteworthy to point out here that throughout all of the accounts we have of Jesus, especially this one leading up to it, every time Jesus performs a miracle or heals, he says, Shh, don't tell anyone about me. Why? Because as we're about to see and observe in these brief moments, every step, every word, every action is to announce that the time has come. His kingship is about to display and show itself in a subversive, countercultural, and counterintuitive way to them, and if we're willing, to us. See verse 2. And he said to them, go into the village, Jesus speaking, in front of you. And immediately, as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. Now, this journey from Bethphage to Bethany was grueling. It was a 15-mile hike where you would climb 4,000 feet it was a rocky, rugged terrain with a climate change. And so Jesus is not looking at the last mile and going, I've had a wild leg day. I, I got to hold something up. Like, I need to rest the old legs. No. Jesus is actually fulfilling an old prophecy. There is something incredibly intentional about it. Remember. Rome was riding in on a horse. Jesus would ride in on a donkey. Jesus is not saying this is the day of vengeance. He's not saying this is a political revamp or an enthronement. Jesus is saying I'm giving a different type of kingdom than you realize. Now just think about it for a moment though from the disciples' point of view. Uh, how awkward must it have been that you have to go grab another person's vehicle? 
Yeah? The disciples are just supposed to go up and say to them, the Lord needs them. Any Star Wars fans, you get it. Y'all, that would be like after church tonight. You go out into the parking lot and you see someone trying to jump your car. And leave with it. And you find somewhere in your soul, maybe not a hint of cussing, but maybe a hue of patience. And you say, what are you doing? And they look back at you and say, oh, the Lord needs it. You might say, which Lord are you talking about? Students, Jesus is authorizing an ancient grand theft auto. Okay? A grand theft donkey, if you like. While this is comical, here is key. Jesus is talking like a king here. He foresees something and he's powerful. He has arranged this moment in life, and I would dare to guess that Jesus is arranging things in your life too, even if it feels confusing. Amen? Verse 4 and 7. The disciples went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said, what are you doing, untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Uh, My wife loves horses. Anyone love horses? They are uh, imposing and impressive, are they not? And still, this king wants to be approachable and accessible. Many of us can't even get the most powerful people in our sphere of influence on the phone. But this king of the universe is accessible, riding on a donkey so that you and I might have him be approachable. Every other religion in the world says you must do these things to ascend to God. We have a God who decided to descend, to be available to us. Now, fairly, that Greek word there is paulos, meaning little horse or little donkey, The significance here is Jesus is pulling on Zechariah chapter 9. Jesus is basically saying, I am a king, but not one that you can conceive of. He's holding both majesty and meekness, glory and grace at the same time. What's the point? Jesus, while he was on earth in his ministry, was concerned with, to quote one um, minority scholar, He was committed to the means of accomplishing his goal, namely sacrificial love. And the means were being gentle and lowly. If you look at Matthew's account, it says, See, your king comes to you humble and gentle. Dan Ortland wrote a wonderful book called Gentle and Lowly. He says it this way, don't miss it. It is the most counterintuitive aspect of Christianity that we are declared right before God, not once we begin to get our act together, but once we collapse into honest acknowledgement that we never will. This holy week, let us follow the one who sits atop the donkey so that he can remind us again the way to life eternal. Wherever you are with God today, have you ever considered his way of life to be eternal rather than temporal? Jesus gave us not only the gift of forgiveness by and flowing from his passion and resurrection, but also a way to follow through the turbulent and tumultuous waters of life. Verses 8 through 10. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hoshana or Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. It was pretty serendipitous uh, that we sang the song Hosanna this evening. Because when I was younger, uh, everybody loved it. And I thought it was weird. Mainly because I had a friend named Anna. 
And you heard the song. It goes, Hosanna. I'm not a good singer. And all I heard was, Hosanna. That's all I heard. And still, if you were to study that Hebrew word, the roots of it, it actually makes sense. It's a guttural word from the very depths of you. It's a praise word being rendered, save us. Save us now. It's evocative. There's an urgency and a desperation to the now. And here, that highlights the human longing for liberation. And did you catch it? For it to be done, to have the propensity for it to be done on our terms. All of this language is from Psalm 118, if you didn't know, uh, the finale of the Hallel songs. The Hallel songs, Psalm 113 to 118, the Hallel songs. I'm telling you this all for the Hallel of it. <laughs> Y'all, I worked really hard on that one this week. You know preachers can't cuss in the pulpit, but that's as close as I'll get, I think. The point, on this journey to Jerusalem every year, they would sing these songs to prepare their hearts for worship. Psalm 113 to 118. And that's why we, as an SHV staff, have put together an online Holy Thursday service for all of us to prepare our hearts for the finale to worship. So this week, you can check that out in our app or on YouTube, this Holy Week, Holy Thursday. And still, stay with me. These palm fronces, these symbols were the cultural confetti of the day. The red carpet, it was the provocative symbol against Rome. The battle cry for deliverance. Just years earlier, Judas Maccabeus led a revolt against the powers of his day, and they welcomed him with palm branches. I see here, this is the moment where people following Jesus did what the psychologists call projection. What does it mean? When we consciously or unconsciously place our expectations onto another. Those in the crowd projected onto Jesus what they thought he should be or what they thought he would be. Don't I, don't we do that. You know, there's a lot of talk about identity today in our culture. With one of the defining traits of modernity being expressive individualism. Look at Carl's Truman work on that. And if we are not careful, we can purport or place upon God sayings like, you know, what I like to think of God as is. The secular creed of our day is to not let anyone challenge our expressions of identity. For us to look inside for the markers of meaning and knowledge. Here's a very gentle question. What happens, though, when we're faced with the vexing conundrum of what to do? When the saving we long for doesn't come in the way that we thought it would or that we planned for, what do we do then? When we see Jesus on our terms alone. Please hear me. It is right and good uh, to anticipate God as the one who shows up, shows off, intervenes, and opens our imaginations. Yet when we have an expectation preloaded with an outcome in mind, it will always lead to a disheartened faith. I say this not just as an exhortation to us, but as a personal confession to you as well. I tend to live with a mixed bag of anticipation and expectation. And this is very much like the audience that we have just been reading about. The people and the disciples wanted a violent uprising. But humility, being crucified, resurrecting, ascending bodily to the Father to then rule over the whole earth, there's never been a strategy or a vision like that. That's what upended them. Parents and students, I say this now as a parent. One of the major points of Palm Sunday is to contrast the lived out values of Rome or our culture 
with the lived out values of Jesus. Do you see it? For specifically us, which one we choose on Palm Sunday plays a big role in our discipleship to him. Moreover, this first Palm Sunday, Jesus unfulfilled their dreams to offer them something so much better. Not temporal alleviation, but eternal renovation. Get this, at the deepest level of our being. You might say, well, that sounds all well and good right now on the surface, but what does that mean for me right now? Well, we're going to come back to this quote at the end, but Max Lucado offers a striking and significant note here. Look with me. When our deepest desire is not the things of God or a favor from God, but God himself, we cross a threshold. And still, there's one more scene, one more prophetic action that is crucial to Palm Sunday. And we see it jumping to verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem. And he, Jesus, entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned uh, the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. For they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teachings. Question. Uh, When Jesus says, My house. Who is the only person who has the right to walk into a house and start rearranging the furniture? Yeah. Maybe an interior decorator? But that's not who Jesus is. Jesus is saying the temple, the house, is his house. Whoa. Many of us are good with the gentle, the good Jesus who's tender, compassionate, humble, attentive to women and children, conscientious of the poor and different races. But here we get a prophetic passion that confronts and leaves us weary. And that's exactly why. Jesus in John chapter 1 came full of grace and truth. Infinite justice and infinite grace. A lion and a lamb. A fragile flower and a sturdy tree. Traits that we would often view as contradictory. But he holds them together. He's a king with authority and compassionate. He is truth-telling and gentle. Holy in his zeal and lovingly tender. If we miss one for the other, we miss his fullness. Yes? Contextually, if you are distrusting of God right now, uh, I want you to hear what Jesus is actually doing here. This moment in the temple is signifying that if anyone is seeking to use God for their own advantage, rather than seeking to bless the world, that really agitates God. For his longing for every person to have union with him. Listen, this is brilliant. The reversal on the road is the reason for the reversal in the temple. What? Once more. The reversal in the temple is the reason for the reversal on the road. This is the gospel. That when people put themselves in the place of the king. Therefore, salvation is when the king comes to put himself in the place of people. To die so that we might live. This gentle servant king, who was the highest king, came so low. Because Jesus' prophetic passion is intended to say, if you only knew what I was trying to do for you, but you don't want any of it. In a very hyper-individualistic culture like ours, where many people will follow their hearts, whenever your life has problems, the only ruler you can overthrow 
is yourself. Isn't that exhausting? Don't we want something more durable and resilient? Well, the clearing of the temple is Jesus illustrating, I have made room for you. Will you make room for me? So, uh, what does, what's the so what? How does this have bearing on our lives at all? Well, as one scholar put it, Palm Sunday is an incredible parable on the lifelong mismatch between what we want from God versus what He is actually providing. Meaning, follow me, uh, moving through our disappointments can uproot us from our limited perspective and leave us open-handedly to receive the good that God is after. Some of you, and me included, are moving and walking through deep disillusionment and disappointment right now. The question is like the first Palm Sunday, how do we not stay lifeless and anemic, but be transformed by God within it? Look with me, Reynolds Price, a Duke professor, put it this way, if 2,000 years of pious handling of this text had not dimmed both its story and its demands, then the gospel would still be seen as the burning outrage that it continues to be. Did you hear it? The act that this scene portrays, the claim that it advances from the first verse to verse 18 is that we make a choice. Does he bring life-transforming truth? Or is it a story of a lunatic telling a tale about a lunatic more wilder than he? I was talking to a spiritual director this week, and he challenged me. You know those challengers in your life? He said, if you give your attention to the brokenness of the world, you'll see it everywhere. But if you give your gaze to the moments of shalom, blessing, healing, and hope, you'll see it more than you think. Once again, Jesus may be leaving you and I's dreams or longings unfulfilled because he has something much greater to offer you. And I would argue it first and foremost is himself. You see, God didn't just save people from Rome or those people that you want to be saved from. He saved Rome too and everyone else as well. His plans for good are wider than our imaginations can hold. What the crowd wanted then was someone to bring judgment down on the world who were messing it up, the Romans. What they actually needed was someone to come and bear the judgment for them because they were ruining the world too which everyone in the human race contributes to. For God to end evil without ending you and me. So, if you are facing a loss of a dream, agony beyond belief, or feeling directionless, please hear me. There's always a possibility for God to meet us in new ways than we previously thought were unimaginable. That is to say, God loves you and me too much to leave us to the smallness of what we know. And that often is the first step to an authentic reckoning for the good that God has in mind. Why? Because one of the learnings of a life with Jesus is to, is to trust his timing, his wisdom, the means, as well as the outcomes. Learning to live with open hands to receive the better gifts that he has rather than grasping for them on our own. The key is, as Dallas Willard would say, look with me, is to hold Jesus before our minds with as much clarity and fullness as possible and to adore him. Here's our question to contemplate. What or who are you and I most attached to right now? Is it your job, happiness, that relationship or not, your vision for your own life? 
Are you and I willing to open up our hands and entrust it to him? The cross felt like a brutal destruction, did it not, of every single person's dream. What does it mean now? Life and hope. Through this harrowing journey of life, there is no Easter without Holy Week. The defeat of violence, death, decay, disease was not uh, wielding power, but giving it up. The cross and the grave establish a new creation in which we can receive as our identity and activity. Thankfully, the message of Palm Sunday is just as true for you now as it was then. He longs to give you something much deeper and fuller and richer than you could have initially thought. His liberation and renovation go as far back as your first, first wound, as deep as your disenchantment now, and as far into eternity with every step as you trust him. Do you want to know the lie that launches a million sins? This is an adaptation of St. Ignatius. It's our unwillingness to trust that what God wants for us is our deepest good. Remember I said we'd come back to this quote? When our deepest desire is not the things of God or a favor from God, but God himself, we cross a threshold. And we're almost done. Uh, Leave it to God to provide a living illustration in a donkey. Of all the commentators on this passage I've ever read, no one has ever talked about the donkey in this way. This is the last thing. This is profound. Animals, as you know, need to be broken or tamed. Yes? Especially a baby donkey going through a wild crowd. Amidst all of the excitement, an unbroken animal is totally calm under the one who controls nature and the storms. Under his hands, Jesus did not have to break the animal. Nothing but harmony and peace comes from the animal submitting to the Lord of creation. Get this. This is a foreshadowing of the entire creation under the meekness, majesty, and goodness of God. Wow. That can be your life. That can be my life. Palm Sunday is Jesus' prophetic passion to you and I for God to give us what we would have asked for if we knew everything that he did. Palm Sunday provides us a vivid sketch to remind ourselves the outcome is not the only thing that we should keep in mind. So, as we look at this quote one last time, give you one thing to think about and a practice, and then we'll sing. When our deepest desire is not the things of God or a favor from God, but God himself, We cross a threshold. Team can come back up. How do we do this? Like Willard said, we bring and we behold. We bring ourselves before God and others and we behold Jesus. We bring our whole selves to God in our disillusionment, our heartache, our disappointment, our lament, and we honestly tell him what's going on with us right now. Sometimes our strongest desires are competing with our deepest ones. When we bring our whole selves before God, he helps us become more curious and concerned with what he's up to than being critical. And then we behold him. We hail him. We look as we're about to sing the goodness of God around me. And we surrender to him. When we move through our disappointment, it can uproot us from our limited perspective. And open us up to receive more open-handedly the good that God is after. When we bring our anger, our sadness, our confusion, and even our unwillingness to talk to him, he stays. He doesn't interrupt. He holds and embraces. And he softens our inner combustion. 
what precedes a great work of God? It's when we surrender, when we express our weakness, and we come to an honest acknowledgement of our powerlessness. It's the tears on the soot faces before the awakening. It's confessing our unwillingness even to be led by him or to open up ourselves to him or to others. It's the path for God to work powerfully in and through your life, through weakness and lowliness. And let me say quickly, there is something disorienting and thrilling about ongoingly walking with Jesus. First, you and I would come to him and he vivifies the things that are beautiful in us. Maybe three things to lean into. And then the beautiful parts will say, we got to talk about the brokenness too. Here's three areas that I want to mend. And even more still, there's three other things I would like for you to give attention to because you wouldn't have thought about it. And it's a way for me to display my grace and renovation to you as well as to others that you wouldn't even dreamt of by yourself. And it's one thing to do that. It's actually a daily strategy. So here's the contemplative exercise as we sing. Maybe the disillusionment that you're feeling right now is God's desire to get your attention. Disillusionment can be a gift. Maybe the disappointment you're experiencing is leading you to have a gospel-appointed and arranged conversation to invite someone to Easter. Maybe the disruption you and I feel at this point is not a denial of the good, but a pathway to open us up to receive the greater good he's after. Maybe the restlessness you have is because our hearts are restless until we find our rest in him. As we sing, would you bring your multi-layered self before the one who offers his healing presence and embrace today? Would we behold him, to hold Jesus before our minds and to adore him? That he's kind, strong, passionate, patient with you and working far deeper and wider than you actually think. Would you come up for prayer or pray with someone else to carry your burdens with you, to believe he's better? He has made room for us. Would we make room for him? Let's sing together. Amen. Would you stand with us?